high school class. Let's aim for a high school class. I will appreciate it. <laughs> I had, I... Like elementary education. Right? I'll be good whenever you are. You good? Yeah. Let's just start. There it is. Yeah, start here. All right, so my name is Corbett Ouellette. Um, I'm a master's student here at MTSU. Uh, I'm working with the uh, GK12 uh, NSF program. And my uh, topic is, does a toxin cause preterm birth? So this is my introduction. Bacteria. What are they? Take a step back in time for a little bit. Imagine you, you just got done playing outside and you, your hands are all dirty and your mother yells at you, you need to wash your hands. You got germs on your hands. You don't want to get sick. Well, what are germs? Well, what are these things? Well, germs are little microorganisms that are invisible to the naked eye. Some of them don't hurt us, but some of them can. Most importantly, bacteria. These are the microorganisms. These are the germs that can get you, uh, sometimes get you sick. So let's talk a little bit more about bacteria. There are some good bacteria out there called lactobacillus is, as one example. Helps make cheese, wine, beer, yogurt, pickles. Did I mention cheese? I'm sorry, that was one of my favorites. Sometimes they're not always this cute, but from time to time they are depending on the type of staining you use. There's also bad types of bacteria. Has anyone had strep throat? I'm sure someone has. It's not good, it's not any fun. It can get you really sick. It's caused by this bacteria called streptococcus. It can also cause pink eye, meningitis, pneumonia, and flesh-eating diseases, which no one ever, ever wants that. So a little bit about my bacteria, Gardnerella vaginalis. It seems to be responsible for um, causing a disease called bacterial vaginosis. Bacterial vaginosis can lead to certain diseases such as pelvic inflammatory disease and increased transmission of HIV but particularly, if a woman is pregnant and she contracts this disease, she could deliver a child preterm. The child could be born too soon. Why is it important? What happens when a child is born too soon? Well, it affects nearly one in nine children, not just bacterial vaginosis, but just preterm birth in general. And if you're born too soon, it can lead to potential problems such as breathing and eating. That's something we all do. That's something that's very important to day-to-day -day life. It can also lead to hearing problems, visual problems. It can also be an emotional and financial stressor on your family. So preterm birth, this is a problem, especially this eating and breathing part of it, right? Preterm birth can sometimes be caused by inflammation. This is very important. But wait a minute, what's, what's, what's inflammation? Well, well, inflammation is your body's attempt to protect itself. But though sometimes it can cause more problems. Inflammation is part of your immune system. It's something that gets turned on when bacteria, amongst other things, are sometimes present. So, okay, let's go back. Okay, I remember when I had strep throat that one time, and my throat really burned. It was a little swollen, and it was, it was red, and it was painful. Well, you know what? That's inflammation. So if a woman gets inflammation when she's pregnant, well, you know what? Sometimes she might deliver preterm. Going back to my bacteria, going back to my germ, this Gardnerella vaginalis, it makes a certain toxin that's related to other toxins that have been known to show inflammation. My research is isolating this toxin and seeing if it causes the same type of inflammation as preterm birth. Sum it all together real quick to make sure we're all on the same page. Gardnerella vaginalis is responsible for, um, for being one of the main bacteria responsible for bacteria vaginosis. Women who get bacterial vaginosis while pregnant can deliver their child too soon because of this inflammation. And Gardnerella vaginalis does make a toxin that's related to other toxins that cause inflammation. Okay, so everything is kind of getting pulled together. My research, try not to fall asleep. If my enthusiasm isn't enough to, uh, to keep you awake, my research methods will bore you to death. So the general concept of my research isolates the uh, Gardnerella DNA. This is the blueprint that's gonna make that toxin. It's going to be isolated. We're going to stick it inside of an E. coli cell. This E. coli cell is really important because it's going to be that factory that makes the toxin. Gardnerella is kind of hard to grow. It's not any fun to grow. We know a lot about E. coli. I'm sure you guys have heard about E. coli at one time or another. And it's, we know a lot about it. And you know what? This E. coli is going to be our little factory to make all of this toxin. We're going to purify the toxin away from the cocktail of other stuff, the hodgepodge of proteins and carbohydrates and other uh, fatty, fatty acids and lipids and things like that. Once we have it purified and isolated, we're going to test it against cells and we're going to determine if this toxin does in fact cause inflammation that's related to preterm birth. So step one, we got to isolate this gene. So in yellow, 
we got our Gardnerella vaginalis. We're going to take that gene, we're going to isolate it, and we're going to stick it in our E. coli. Blue and yellow make green. That's right. OK, so this green, this E. coli, is going to become our vaginal isin factory. We've got our Gardnerella gene inside an E. coli. We've got our E. coli vaginal isin factory. Oh, that's right. Well, you know what? We probably need to stick some more DNA in there, too. Inside that Gardnerella DNA, inside that little black band right there, we stuck in a special type of magnet that's going to bind to some beads. And I'm going to show you a demonstration of what I'm going to do here in a little bit. We also stuck in a little uh, selectable marker. How do we know the right E. coli is growing right? How do we know we've got the right one? Well, you know what? Under the right conditions, we're going to light up. Not like Chris's or uh, Patrick's uh, luciferase, but you know what? We're still going to see some growth. We're still going to see something, and everything else isn't going to be visible. It's not even going to grow. So here's how I'm going to isolate and purify my vaginal lysin. I've got a special type of, uh, of a filter. It's going to separate my toxin from other cell junk. Here's my cell lysate. I've got a whole bunch of E. coli that I just grew up, and there's a whole bunch of vaginal lysin inside of it, as, long as, as well as other proteins and carbohydrates and lipids and all that other stuff I said beforehand. I'm going to take all that stuff out, stick it inside the column, and all that random, not important black bead stuff, that's just in the bottom. We don't need that. But these special binding beads, that's going to bind our vaginal ice, and that's going to bind our important stuff. We're going to take this, we're going to dump it, get rid of it. We don't want it. Put a new container in. And then we've got these super particles called an elution buffer. And then what this is going to do, it's going to go inside the column, it's going to displace our vaginal lysin, and our vaginal lysin is going to be isolated and purified. We're going to do the same type of thing to get rid of other um, conflicting variables. If we're doing good science, we want to make sure we're testing just the vaginal lysin and not any other molecules that can cause inflammation. Data, data, data. So here's my isolated vaginal lysin. This is after running it through a column. In the uh, first pair of lanes, I got my total cell lysate, I got a bunch of stuff in there, a bunch of stuff in two, three, four. Well, hey, look at this, I'm five, I got a single band. Well, if you do a western blot, when you tag just our vaginal lysin, well, hey, that little selectable marker I stuck in, that little magnet, I can use that to detect it on the special type of protein blot. And this blot's just showing that I do have an isolated vaginal lysin. So once I had my vaginal lysin isolated, I wanted to make sure it was actually going to start killing some cells. So what I did, I took a little bit of toxin, I gave it to the cells. Hey, we still got a lot of growth going on. Let's give them a little bit more toxin. Okay, so we still got a little bit more growth. Uh-oh. Once we get up to uh, about 500 nanograms, which is a lot, we went from 5 nanograms, a lot of them were still alive, to 100 times as much. We're starting to get a lot of death. Not a lot of toxin, lots of live cells. Lots of toxin, a lot of dead cells. So some of my future steps, um, I'm going to be removing the number of variables, the other um, conflicting variables that are messing with my vaginal lysin. There are special inflammatory molecules, um, IL-18, IL-1-beta, and TNF-alpha. Alpha. These are the ones that I'm going to use to test um, vaginal lysin against. These are the uh, molecules that I'm going to be looking for. I'm also going to want to look at different levels of vaginal lysin produced in different types of E. coli strains. Now, there's different types of lactobacillus strains. Some will help make yogurt, some will help make beer. There's different types of strains of bacteria, different types of um, Gardnerella as well. And I want to see if there's different levels of vaginal lysin inside these different level, uh, inside these different strains of Gardnerella. If there's different levels of vaginal lysin, maybe one strain of Gardnerella is worse than the other. So that's one other research route I'm kind of looking at. I want to thank Dr. Tony Ferone, Mary Ferone for being my bosses. Um, Eric Vick for putting up with my BS, the rest of the Ferone lab, the uh, NSF GK12 program, and the rest of the uh, Middle Tennessee State University biology program. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of cells did you use on the lysis? Uh, human red blood cells. Um, they're just easy to deal with. They have very little inflammation response. When I first tested the toxin, I hadn't ran it through my... Um, my um, LPS column, and LPS is going to be a conflicting variable when I test my cells. Um, so I just decided to use human red blood cells, 
There's very, very little inflammation response. I just wanted to see if the toxin was going to blow up the rest of the cells and cause an actual response. And one other question. Uh, why do you think the toxin is going to cause inflammation? Oh, so why do I think the toxin is going to cause inflammation? Well, let me go to one of my other charts. Or two, actually. Two other charts, actually. <laughs> right there. Right? I like so, <laughs> you want to hear more about this one? You'll be yeah. saving for the next round. Oh, I've got another, you know what, I've got a, oh. Yeah, we, we didn't coordinate this, by the way. This is just supplemental. So anyways, we, did, we always coordinate colors. So anyways, Gardnerella vaginalis, it's been shown to cause inflammation. Um, I actually forgot to put in another slide in here with another graph that has streptolysin O on there. Streptolysin O was one of the related toxins that I was um, talking about earlier. Streptolysin O is going to cause an increase in the uh, TNF alpha, and I believe it was the in a uh, IL-1 beta. Between the streptolysin inflammation response and our Gardnerella inflammation response, we can kind of say it's like, well, A causes B and C causes B, so you know what, let's see if, uh, if D causes B as well. You know, we want to see if I can pull everything together and see if it's the toxin that's really responsible for the inflammation or if it's something else, but fingers crossed, it's a toxin. So, time dependent? It will be time dependent. I'm still tweaking my uh, different time periods. Um, going back to my death curve, I'm looking in between 20 nanograms and 100 nanograms for my uh, toxin treatment. Um, I'm going to be testing, I go overboard the first time. I'm probably going to do six hour treatments, 6, 12, um, 18, 24, 30, 36, just to get a good, you know, not good science, but just, okay, let's see what I have, let's see what I get the best results from, and then I'll go in a second time, and once I find my more ideal time points, I'll, so, I'll follow, you know, proper protocol, um, but I still need to evaluate my, my specific time points. With um, the other data, I believe they were 24-hour treatments, if I remember correctly, um, and there seemed to be a good inflammatory response, but that's